In the film Quest for Fire, Homo sapiens taught Neanderthals how to start a fire, which amazed the primitive beings. In fact, one of the first anthropologists to study the Neanderthal man concluded that, in the most ancient crania, the occipital region was the most developed and the frontal region the least developed, and that the elevation of the latter marked the transition from barbarous to civilized man. The prominent brow ridges, the largish and broad nasal aperture, the large teeth, the lack of a mental process on the chin, and the occipital bun have all resulted in numerous bestial portraits of Neanderthals. You could say Neanderthals are an extreme version of Homo sapiens. These previous attempts to characterize Neanderthal brains as primitive were based on skull examinations, which allowed anthropologists to see what they believed or desired to believe, particularly in terms of the occipital and frontal lobes. Neanderthals have always been regarded as primitive, and some now regard them as large-brained but lacking high-level intelligence and retaining primitive features in their brain. Nonetheless, their physical characteristics are most likely due to physiology, morphology, and metabolic adaptations associated with muscularity and living in a glacial and tundra-like environment rather than lack of behavioral complexity. Surely no other human group has faced so many derogatory insults as our distant cousins from eons ago. All manner of pathological and evolutionary insults have been directed at this early representative of a lineage whose brain was slightly larger than ours. The final blow to the Neanderthal image is the widely held belief that, due to a lack of artwork, Neanderthals were unsophisticated, babbling away with a severely limited language. Yet studies show the Neanderthal brain was fully human, with no essential differences in organization from our own. It was simply larger and for at least two reasons. It was metabolically efficient in glacial and cold tundra habitats, and it was associated with a greater amount of lean body mass than our own, so the larger size was primarily due to larger body size. Other theories are that the large brain was due to the fact that Neanderthals had larger eyes and were highly skilled in physical and hand-eye coordination. According to the most widely quoted study, Neanderthals had slightly larger brains than modern humans, this fact can be found in any textbook on human evolution, often along with measurements of endocranial volume, which is the space inside a skull. This value averages 1,410 cubic centimetres for Neanderthals and 1,350 cubic centimetres for modern humans. But does 60 cubic centimetres of brain matter make any difference? While brain size is important, cognitive abilities are affected by a variety of factors such as body size, neuron density, and how specific brain regions are enlarged and connected. Some of these variables are unknown for Neanderthals because we only have their cranial bones, not their brains. Further investigation of these numbers revealed that these commonly cited measurements are from Holloway's 2004 book on fossil human skulls, but the original estimates can be found in a 1985 study, which was primarily based on another study from 1975. The study found that the minimum Neanderthal brain volume was 1,200 cubic centimetres, with the maximum being 1,700 cubic centimetres in the Amud Neanderthal. In fact, this original study includes six skulls now classified as early Homo sapiens, four from Skull in the Levant, and two from Jebel Irhud in northwest Africa. Nonetheless, when these skulls are removed from the study, the overall brain volume remains relatively stable. Though the Neanderthal brain was larger than their predecessors, we can learn from Neanderthals that size is not always important. But did Neanderthals really have larger brains than modern humans? It would appear to be a straightforward question. This depends on which group of Neanderthals we are comparing. Do we limit ourselves to recent Neanderthals from less than 70,000 years ago, or do we include specimens from the last interglacial 120,000 years ago, or even older specimens from 200,000 years ago? When brain size, neural patterns, and asymmetries are all taken into account, Neanderthal brain endocasts do not exhibit primitive features as many believe. One of the major issues is that dating is not always precise, and we frequently do not have enough of the skeleton to tell whether the skull came from a male, female, or a juvenile. However, Anthropologists have taken advantage of these hollow skulls to learn as much as possible about the Neanderthal mind. The brain volume of modern humans 
Homo sapiens, varies greatly, ranging from less than 1,000 to more than 2,000 cubic centimetres, so the largest modern volume exceeds that of any known early human species. As a matter of fact, since larger bodies have larger brains, any significant difference disappears once the heavier bodies of Neanderthals are factored in. Since our common ancestor, the lineages have increased in brain size, albeit in distinct ways. To accommodate larger brains, Neanderthal crania expanded lengthwise like footballs, whereas modern human skulls became more globular, similar to soccer balls. By 150,000 years ago, members of both species had brains larger than 1,400 cubic centimetres. To determine fossil brain volume, anthropologists have traditionally filled skulls with beads or seeds and poured the contents into a graduated cylinder. They've also submerged skull moulds in water and measured the volume displaced. Today, computed tomography scanning methods provide more accurate measurements, but much of the data in textbooks and other references was gathered in the traditional manner. Nevertheless, Neanderthal brains rarely occupied an intermediate position between ancient fossils and modern humans. They appeared to be evolving in their own direction over time, rather than gradually approaching a modern brain shape. Overall, Neanderthal brain size appears to have increased over the last 100,000 years of existence, though some of the skulls may have been from females and or juveniles, influencing the mean brain size. Female skulls, for example, have been found at Tabun, Krapina, and Forbes Quarry. In adulthood, modern human male brains are 10% to 15% larger than female brains, and this difference persists even after accounting for body height. Based on these findings, researchers confidently conclude that fossil Neanderthals and modern humans from the same time period had comparable brain sizes. 23 Neanderthal skulls, dating from 40,000 to 130,000 years ago, had endocranial volumes ranging from 1,172 to 1, 740 cubic centimetres. The sample of 60 Stone Age Homo sapiens ranged in volume from 1,090 to 1,775 cubic centimetres. For another study, scientists studied 32 human and 13 Neanderthal skulls, ranging in age from 27,000 to 75,000 years, and discovered that Neanderthal eyes were 15% larger on average than modern human eyes. Neanderthals had much larger bodies than humans, with broader shoulders, thicker bones, and a more robust overall structure. To account for this discrepancy, the researchers consulted previous research on the estimated body masses of skeletons found with these skulls and other Neanderthals. In primates, the amount of brain capacity devoted to body control is proportional to body size, so the scientists were able to estimate how much of the Neanderthals' brains were dedicated to this task. However, after accounting for these differences, the researchers discovered that Neanderthals had significantly less brain volume available for other tasks. In other words, mental capacity not dedicated to seeing the world or moving the body than ancient Homo sapiens. Although the average brain volumes of the two groups studied were nearly identical, 1,473.84 cubic centimeters for early modern humans, and 1,473.46 for Neanderthals, the average corrected Neanderthal brain volume was only 1,133.98 cubic centimetres, compared to 1,332.41 for early modern humans. According to measurements taken from 122 global populations, the average adult brain size for recent humans is 1,349 cubic centimetres. This means that the average Neanderthal brain volume, which was approximately 1410 cubic centimetres, was greater than the current human average. Nonetheless, all of the Neanderthals measured are well within the range of modern humans. The brains of Neanderthals and ancient humans were remarkably similar in size, roughly 90 cubic inches. But that doesn't imply they were the same. The exact reason why Neanderthal brains did not ignite like modern humans is unknown, but the anthropology community has proposed numerous theories. Some argue that the destiny for the Neanderthal was to remain a noble savage, in a state of permanent ignorance. Although this leap was an advancement in some ways over their predecessors, 
as these evolutionary leaps are supposed to demonstrate, the Neanderthals did not appear to be as prepared for the ice-free world ahead as modern humans were. The Neanderthals' last common ancestor may have produced a species of humans suitable for cave-dwelling, and not much else. In fact, some consider the leap into Neanderthals to be an evolutionary dead end. This flawed leap may have contributed to their extinction approximately 40,000 years ago. Although modern humans and our prehistoric Neanderthal relatives are very similar, there are some significant differences between the two, the most notable of which are more densely packed frontal lobes. Researchers discovered that modern humans produce more neurons in their frontal lobes than Neanderthals due to a single amino acid substitution in a protein. This small distinction could have given modern humans a cognitive advantage over Neanderthals. Only one of the amino acid building blocks in the brain distinguishes the current human version of the gene, TKTL1, from the Neanderthal version. According to the study, this mutation is found in almost all modern humans, but not in Neanderthals, Denisovans, extinct archaic humans, or other prehistoric humans. This small mutation in TKTL1 means that the Neanderthal version of the protein has lysine, whereas the modern human version has arginine. The researchers believe this protein would promote the proliferation of neural progenitor cells, which evolve into neurons as the brain grows, in a region of the brain known as the neocortex, which is critical for cognitive function. They hypothesized that this could explain modern humans' cognitive advantage. The neocortex of modern humans is either denser or occupies a larger portion of the brain than that of Neanderthals, whose brains were estimated by fossil records to be roughly the same size as those of modern humans. Scientists were astounded to learn that such a minor genetic variation could have such a large impact on neocortical development. However, evidence shows that this spark did not occur in Neanderthal brains. When modern humans first emerged from Africa, they encountered some Neanderthals, possibly as few as 25 Neanderthal females interbred with these modern humans. Nonetheless, according to one study, that would be sufficient numbers to interbreed and have enough genetic diversity. And then that Neanderthal DNA is carried by modern humans as they spread out and diversified across the world. And with that tantalizing statement, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, stay curious and stay questioning. Also, please subscribe, share and explore our channel's other highly compelling videos. Thank you and take care.